Well, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good, good. Uh, and, and I'm trusting that you said great. Uh, a little difficult to hear from way up here. Uh, we are starting a brand new class um, topic uh, today, and I'm honored to be your teacher uh, for this, this quarter. Uh, and this, this class is really, I think, uh, essential. It's essential to us as disciples of Jesus, essential as we try to, you know, mold and shape our lives after Jesus. Uh, we could look at Jesus from the perspective of, okay, well, he did this, and so let me go and mold my life after some of these things that, that Jesus did. What we're going to do with this class is really mold our lives ba based upon something that Jesus said, and something that Jesus said over and over and over again, that if, if we're not careful, we'll miss it, uh, and it is Jesus's uh, his insistence on talking about the kingdom of God. So over the next number of weeks, uh, I think we got 12 left. Over the next number of weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the subject of the kingdom uh, from a kind of a biblical theological standpoint. Uh, the kingdom uh, as uh, revealed through Old Testament scripture and New Testament scripture what we're going to find are the, the people of God who are described as uh, the kingdom of God. We're going to see their trials and their travails as they are a united people, uh, as they, uh, through our, our study of the Old Testament, as they become a divided people. But then we're going to see the, the goal, the, the ideal for the kingdom of God is that uh, they be this united people again. And we're going to see that uh, through the church, uh, through the Bible's example of what the church is supposed to be. And in the end, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to live kingdom lives. And we're going to see a prescription for a life within the kingdom that Jesus has called all of us uh, to live. And so that's what we're going to be doing for the next uh, number of weeks. Uh, so hopefully uh, you'll, you'll uh, be able to be consistent and to gain something from this, this study of the, the very important, essential uh, kingdom of God. So what we're going to do today is we're going to start just with a, a couple of kind of uh, ground floor type things. We're going to look at the, the essentiality of the kingdom. Why I would say the kingdom is so essential uh, to the people of Jesus. Then we're going to look at the ideal state of what the kingdom of God was. We see the kingdom of God even before those, uh, that term, that terminology is used biblically, before we see kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven used, uh, before we even talk about a physical kingdom, we get a glimpse of what this kingdom life, what life underneath the rule of God looked like, uh, and we'll see that uh, in uh, the time of Eden. And then we'll, we'll eventually uh, move toward this fall that happened in Eden. And we get to see the first signs of a divided kingdom. But again, it's before that, that terminology is even used. And, uh, and, and then we'll, we'll put a comma uh, there uh, at, for the end of today. And the next week we'll come back and, and talk about more of a physical kingdom uh, perspective. But if you don't mind, let's, let's pray to God, uh, ask the Holy Spirit to kind of guide our, our study today. Lord, we're thankful for who you are. We're thankful for all that you do. We're thankful for any time we get a chance to study your word, to hear from you. Dear God, we understand uh, through our study uh, and through uh, what you have revealed in your word how important the kingdom of God is. Father, help that to resonate. Uh, help that, uh, that importance that you've placed upon it. Help us to place an equal amount of importance upon such a subject. Help us to understand it. Help us learn how to live within your kingdom. Help us learn how to be. Help us learn how to be holy and loving and dedicated to everything that has to do with King Jesus. We ask that you bless every individual soul in this audience uh, today. Father, fill us with your spirit. Guide us by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen. Uh, And so we're talking about the kingdom, the united and divided people of God. But uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the essentiality of the kingdom. Why this message is so very essential uh, to the, the very people of God. The subject of the kingdom was essential. I call it essential because it was essential to Jesus of Nazareth. If we look at the words of Jesus of Nazareth through Matthew and through Mark, Luke, and John, when we look at the life and times of Jesus and look at his ministry, the thing that I think will be drawn out more and more is how important the subject of the kingdom of God actually was. If we look at Matthew's gospel, in Matthew, Jesus mentions the kingdom of heaven which is synonymous with the kingdom of God. Matthew calls it the kingdom of heaven, quite likely because of his original audience being those of the, the ancient Jews and uh, how they, they ceased from using the name of God quite often out of reverence. Uh, but he calls it the kingdom of heaven, but it is this, this kingdom of God. Matthew, in Matthew, Jesus uses that reference or mentions the kingdom of heaven or God uh, more than 40 times. As a matter of fact, it can be said, and I think quite accurately, that the favorite subject of Jesus was indeed this kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. More than love, more than money, more than heaven, more than hell, more than the church, Jesus speaks about this subject, the kingdom of heaven, more than anything else, more than salvation. And that's always mind-blowing to me because we know that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. We know that he established the church. We know that Jesus came to show love to mankind. But to Speak about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven more than all of these subjects really shows us how essential the kingdom was. And it was essential even from the very moment he began his public ministry. I want to invite you to Matthew's gospel. Uh, I have it here, but uh, it it might be a little bit small uh, on the screen, but you probably can see it uh, on on the, the large screen behind me. Uh, Matthew chapter number 4, verses 12 through 17. Now this, this text uh, gives us a glimpse of how important the kingdom of God was to Jesus. I would say, I would venture to say that it was priority one. Here's what the text reads, or how the text reads. Now, when he had heard John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, uh, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. He lives here, he works there uh, to uh, fulfill the prophecy uh, of, uh, of Isaiah. But verse 17 is key. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From that time, from the very outset of his public ministry, uh, his ministry which helped to fulfill prophecy, Fulfilling prophecy would have been important for uh, Matthew uh, because of his audience, the ancient Jews. And so Matthew is tying Jesus, fulfilling this prophecy, onto the ancient Jewish prophet uh, Isaiah, ancient Israelite prophet Isaiah. But from the very beginning, Jesus says, repent. Now that word is important. It's important for us biblically and and theologically, this changing that Jesus is calling people to. But the purpose of the repentance, the repentance has a purpose. And the purpose is for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's essential 
for Jesus. Right at the beginning, I want you to repent because of this. It's at hand. It's, it's, it's ready. It's, it's being birthed. It's, it's ready to make its appearance upon this earth at the beginning of his ministry. Matthew goes on to say in Matthew 4, 23 through 25, and he, he being Jesus, went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. What do we see about Jesus here? Jesus had a three-pronged ministry. Prong number one, he taught in their synagogues. And perhaps uh, the subject of his teaching uh, is prong number two that we see revealed here, proclaiming, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. What comes along with the kingdom of God is good news. When we speak of the kingdom, it is a degree of good news. Good news of salvation, good news of deliverance, good news of God reigning as king. And prong number three, he healed every affliction among the people. Now, uh, class, what I would call you to is that these three prongs, the teaching, the preaching, the healing, they all have something to do with the kingdom of God. The teaching and the subject matter of the teaching, uh, kingdom of God. The preaching, the subject matter of the preaching, kingdom of God. And the fact that he is able to heal, that is a visible demonstration of the kingdom of God. And Jesus is going to show us why that is uh, a little bit later. If we see these types of miracles for Jesus, that was proof that the kingdom of God had indeed come among them. And as a result of the three-pronged kingdom ministry that Jesus has, verse number 24, so his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. Visible demonstration of the kingdom of God. What Jesus is showing from the very beginning is how important the kingdom of God was to his ministry. If we were to continue uh, surveying the book of Matthew, and eventually we come to something called the Sermon on the Mount, and that's in Matthew chapter 5 through ver, uh, chapter number 7. Now what the Sermon of the Mount was, it's, it's Jesus' probably most famous discourse at any one time. His largest, his longest sermon uh, that, that we're, we're going to read about recorded here in, in Matthew. But the Sermon on the Mount is more than just some good and pithy sayings of Jesus. It's more than just, hey, consider this, uh, consider that, um, remember this, remember that. What the Sermon on the Mount really was, it, it had everything to do with the kingdom of God. It instructs one on how to live life within the kingdom of God. Uh, if you uh, have a, a Bible, because I don't have this written, uh, we're just going to kind of freestyle this here in a minute. Uh, Matthew chapter number 5 uh, and through Matthew chapter number 7. I'm just going to pull out a couple of things, and I'm going to show you their, their kingdom, their kingdom uh, relevance. If we were to get past the, the Beatitudes, which of course are about the kingdom of God, and we get to verse number 13 of chapter number 5, we read like this, the English Standard Version. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven." I want to invite you to see this from a kingdom perspective, from a kingdom life perspective. What Jesus is drawing one toward, how to live life within the kingdom of God. So how does one live life within the kingdom of God, Jesus? Well, one lives life in the kingdom of God by being a light, a light 
uh, that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. A light that gives light to all in the house. A light that is, uh, is shown by showing good works before men so that God, the Father and King, might receive glory. So all throughout this, he is sharing, instructing, and teaching his disciples and anyone else who's in earshot on how to live life within the kingdom. He discusses subjects such as anger. How would I handle anger within the kingdom of God? Verse number 21 of chapter 5, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. What Jesus is drawing his disciples to is a higher standard of life, higher standard of how to handle anger, how to handle lust, how to handle the situation that they were dealing with during those times of divorce, a higher standard of retaliation, uh, and how to handle if someone were to strike you, how to handle these things within the very kingdom of God. He spends so much time on this because it is so essential. If we were to continue to read after the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus eventually sends out his disciples. And the focus of the sending out of his disciples was to proclaim the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 10 and verses 5 through 8, we read this. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And proclaim as you go, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he gave them certain power. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without pay. Why would he give them such power and ability? Well, it confirmed his word, but it also confirmed the word of the kingdom of God. Jesus' three-pronged ministry He's handing down to them. His ministry was about the kingdom. Their proclamation was to be about the kingdom. What's the point in all of this? The point is the essentiality of the kingdom for not only Jesus, but his disciples. And it points the way to the essentiality of the kingdom for you and I, who are his disciples on this planet at this point in time. What was important to Jesus must be important to us if indeed we are uh, his disciples as well. But Jesus is not the only one who understands how important the kingdom is. And uh, his disciples aren't the only ones who understood how important the kingdom of God is. There is, North Boulevard, an enemy who understands how important this is. And this enemy that we deal with doesn't want this knowledge of the fact that there is a different kingdom, a kingdom ruled by God. He doesn't want the knowledge of that to enter into the ears of men and women, boys and girls. Why would that be? Because if it doesn't enter their ears, they can't be set free. And he doesn't want them to be set free. He doesn't want us to be set free. He doesn't want us to live lives within this kingdom. He doesn't want us to enjoy the joy and the peace and the love and the security that comes with a different kingdom, with, that comes from understanding that God rules. And so his tactic is to snatch away any knowledge of the kingdom of God before it takes uh, root. The evil one wants to snatch away the word of the kingdom. In Matthew 13, uh, verses 18 through 23, uh, we read this. Hear then the parable of the sower. 
when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, okay, there's that, there's that phrase again, the kingdom. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it. And we have to understand the word of the kingdom might not be easy for people within this culture to understand right away. Because one, we, we, we live in a, in a, in a time uh, that, that values other things over valuing what God has established. We value uh, our opinions. We value our thoughts. We value our desires. We value our lusts. We value anything that's surrounded by our pride. God's kingdom is an upside-down kingdom. It is the opposite of all of that. Where in our kingdoms, in the kingdoms of our own worlds, we are the most exalted. In God's kingdom, He is most exalted. In our kingdoms, it's really about what we feel and what we want. In God's kingdom, it's about really what He wants and what He uh, desires. In our kingdom, it's about what makes us feel good. In God's kingdom, it's about what pleases God. And so uh, it, it might be hard to understand, and the evil one seeks to use that to his advantage. But watch what he does. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand, the evil one comes and snatches away that which has been sown in his heart. The very thing he wants to prevent is the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God taking root in our heart. And he will use whatever means necessary to distract us and to prevent that very thing from taking place. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. And what word would that be? Well, according to the context, it's the word of the kingdom. Whoever hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, well, what word would that be? Contextually, it's the word of the kingdom. Immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. Again, contextually, it's still the same word. It's the word of the kingdom. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word of the kingdom. And it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word of the kingdom, understands it, and indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, and another 60, and another 30. If that word of the kingdom is able to take root, it will produce a ripe and bountiful fruit. It will grow. Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God elsewhere, and, and he speaks about how it, can, it starts small, but it can grow big. Kingdom growth is such as that. You start small and you grow big. And God gives that increase. So just, uh, just kind of a, a recap on the essentiality of the kingdom. The kingdom of God was the foundation of Jesus' ministry. It's at the very beginning. Very first thing he goes out and proclaims. Very first thing he goes out and proves. It's essential. If the kingdom was the subject that Jesus spoke about more than any other subject, shouldn't it be a subject that we spend time thinking about, considering, talking about as the church, as disciples? My my answer to that is yes, and we're going to kind of point out what that might look like. If the kingdom was the very thing that he sent his disciples to proclaim, which we see it is, Shouldn't it be what's on our lips? It was essential. If the kingdom is something the evil one wants to remove from our minds, shouldn't it be something we're paying attention to? Because that's what he's paying attention to. It's a subject that we have to consider. But it's a subject, I think, wrapped in a degree of mystery Uh, wrapped in an enigma. It's a subject that um, 
I, I, grew, up in the, I grew up in the church, okay? I'm one of those. Uh, I was a preacher's kid. And, um, but growing up in the church, I didn't hear a lot of talk about, there's a couple of subjects I didn't hear a lot about growing up, okay? I didn't hear a lot of talk about the Holy Spirit, okay, growing up. Maybe you were like that. We, it was this Holy Ghost that, we, that, that, that was spoken about, and that was scary. And I remember asking, well, what is this, you know, and you're a kid, and you're talking about a ghost, and it's holy, you know, so on one hand it's good, but it's still a ghost. And so that would, that, that would frighten me, and I remember asking, well, what in the world is this Holy Ghost? And someone kind of gave an answer, but it, it wasn't really a substantial answer. It was this enigmatic, this mysterious type of answer. But the second subject that really wasn't spoken a lot about was the kingdom of God. And when the kingdom of God was spoken about, uh, it was spoken about as if it were directly synonymous with the church. In other words, church, kingdom are the very same thing. And I get the point of that, okay? But when you start looking biblically, you, you, you see that they are related, but they're not synonymous. It's different. The word that Jesus uses when he speaks of kingdom is uh, this Greek word basileia. When we see the church used in New Testament Greek, uh, we see that word ekklesia. Ekklesia, a, uh, an assembly of, uh, of, of believers, really. Uh, during the time when, uh, in the first century, when that word ekklesia was used, uh, the word ekklesia uh, was a, a commonly used word, and, and it meant assembly. Uh, if you would think of a government that came together, uh, you know, you have a House of Representatives or Senate, and they kind of come together, and they, and, they, and they meet, and they have periods of time when that general assembly meets. Well, that gen general assembly uh, in the time of the first century would have been the ecclesia. It didn't have any religious necessary, it didn't have any necessary religious connotation, but it meant assembly, a group of people coming together. And it was a, a specific group of people. It was a group of people who had a degree of ruling and a, a authoritar author authoritarian kind of authoritative power. A group of people who came together to make decisions. Uh, that was the first century uh, common termed ecclesia. And I think it has something to do, uh, it points the way to the church, what we know as the church. The church is a group of people who have come together, uh, and they have certain powers, okay? They have certain authority. They are a kingdom people. And this is how I think the church and the, the kingdom are, are interrelated, but the, the kingdom itself is, is different. It's larger than what we would call the church or the church of Christ. The word basileia means reign or rule. And so, if we were to take this biblically and look at kingdom of God, basileia of God, to define the kingdom is, it can be defined as the reign or rule of God. In its most basic sense, it's God ruling as king. And so what Jesus is seeking to get people ready for is to be ready for that type of rule. To repent, to change, to change the heart from ruling themselves to allowing God to rule. And if you think about it, which is better? Is it better when you rule or is it better when God rules? In what way is life better? Is it better when you're doing things your way or when you're doing things God's way? Well, for you and I, it probably just makes sense. Well, of course, it, it, it makes sense to do things God's way. Things just seem to go better, not without challenges, but things just seem to go better when I do things God's way. Well, if you can understand that concept, we can understand life underneath 
the kingdom of God. Why wouldn't Jesus teach that? If God loves us so much, why wouldn't he want that for men and women? It's what he's always wanted. It's what he still wants. So if we were going to define the kingdom of God, and it's really not, you know, a hard thing to kind of understand, it's the reign and the rule of God. It's God ruling uh, as king. Let's go further with the definition so we can, we can really understand what this looks like. In that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches a prayer. It's typically called the Lord's Prayer. But I don't really view it as the Lord's Prayer. He's teaching the disciples how to pray. It's, it's really the disciples' prayer. Because there's some things within this prayer that, that Jesus really wouldn't have any need to, to ask his Father for. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 6 uh, and verse number 9. Let's back up to verse number 7 just for context. Matthew 6, I don't have this one on the screen. I have a, a verse of it on the screen, but I want you to see the whole context. Remember, think God reigning as king. This is a kingdom prayer for a disciple. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your name be hallowed. May your name be seen as holy. Kingdom prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to go back to verse 10 in a minute. Give us this day our daily bread, provision. Under the kingdom, we need God's provision. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let me draw you back to verse number 10, because I think this is a good glimpse of how we can see the kingdom. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is the kingdom? Well, the kingdom is the realm where God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. If we can imagine heaven, God ruling in heaven, we know the angels, they constantly sing, they constantly give him adoration and praise. We know, and we can probably picture and believe, that in heaven, it's all about God. Angels constantly saying, holy, holy, holy. It's constantly about, make no, we, we can make no mistake about it. It's about Him. So, this kingdom of heaven upon earth If you want to understand the kingdom, it's the realm where God's will is being done on earth the same way as it is in heaven. We're living kingdom lives when God's will is being done in our lives on earth as it is in heaven. When it's all about God, God is reigning as king. If it's not about God, then he's not reigning as king. But the kingdom of God is the realm where God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. And so here is a kind of a comprehensive definition that I, that I would draw you to. The kingdom of God is the realm where God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven through the reign of King Jesus. And that should be what our lives are about. And that should be what the message that we proclaim. And that should be what we're looking to try to establish on earth. God reigning as king through King Jesus. The realm where his will is being done. In your heart, in your mind, in your life, in your activity. This is what Jesus was indeed And it's a kingdom that is now, and it's a not yet. 
It's a now because this is, this is uh, perfectly within the realm of possibility that can happen right now. He can reign like this upon this earth. This was the prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We can experience that type of reign right now. The world can experience that type of reign right now. But the full consummation of that reign is more of a, an eternal reign. This is what shall happen in the final consummation of all things. God will be reigning like this. In some capacity, in some way, in some shape, and in some form, it shall happen. And we see that biblically. But he's always done this. He's always reigned like this. Um, the fact that men and women might not surrender themselves to him doesn't mean that he hasn't always reigned like this. When he created this planet, when he created the heavens and the earth, this earth was set up to mirror that type of reign. It was set up so that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to draw you to uh, Genesis chapter number one. And we're going to see this, this very beginning uh, of creation. And we see, we know that God created the heavens and the earth. We know that he created uh, the plants, uh, the oceans, sky, uh, the lights, uh, every creeping thing, every animal. But then he created man. And it's the creation of this mankind where we see this microcosm of what God intended. We see the very beginnings uh, of the kingdom uh, of God. Even before those, that, that term was used, this is the reality of the kingdom. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. The image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. I want to highlight two words. What's well, one word? And that word is dominion. God gave man dominion. To give dominion, you have to first possess dominion. So God was reigning, but God lent mankind. He put man as a steward over the earth. He gave man ruling powers over the earth. But what you're seeing is the microcosm of God actually reigning. Though man has dominion, he's given dominion by the one who truly has dominion, and the one who has dominion is the king. It's God reigning. And what we see is God's will being done. There are, there are, uh, there's, there's a phrase that we see when God created something uh, during this creative process. He would look at it. He would say, it is good, or it was good. That, that's because that was his will. His will was being done on earth the same way it was in heaven. God said, verse 29, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And then there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. It was good because it was according to his will. But there in that garden, God was supplying. There in the garden, God was reigning, he was ruling, and he was providing. He was providing food, he was providing everything that was needed. Microcosm of the kingdom of God. This is the way he wanted it to be. 
This is the way he still wants it to be. If we would but surrender our will to his divine will, we can reside in something like that. Genesis 2 uh, goes further with this concept. Verse 15 through 25. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground of the Lord, the Lord had formed, uh, God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. That was because of the dominion given to him by God. Uh, the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast uh, of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of the ribs, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman. Uh, verse number 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. What we see is a microcosm, a glimpse, a foreshadowing of the united people of God underneath his kingdom. They were one. They were one flesh. They were naked and unashamed. They were free. They were authentic because they, at this point, we're doing things God's way. You know what, disciples? We, we never have to be ashamed of anything when we do things God's way. We can live in authenticity, not trying to hide anything, not being scared of getting caught in anything. When we do things God's way, it's part of us being this united people of God, and this is what we have with Adam and Eve. God is providing, doing things his way, and he's providing for them, but he gives them this caveat. Listen, you got to be careful about something. You've got to be careful not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Verse 17, but of the, not, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Things will change when you disobey. Things will change when you start doing things your way. But peace and degree of joy, life, all that can be yours if you just let me continue to rule. So what happens to this united people of God? Well, what happens is what is introduced is a different type of kingdom. All we have, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, God reigning as king. And what it looks like when God reigns as king. And the benefits of God reigning as king. His will being done on earth as it is in heaven. But in Genesis 3, we see the activity of the evil one. Who we read about in Matthew as we were setting the stage for this. He wants to rob man of the word of that kingdom, of God reigning, of God ruling. He wants to snatch it out of our hands. And this is what happens in Genesis chapter number 3. So in Genesis, chapter, Genesis 2, we see the united people of God, man and woman, one flesh, underneath the reign and rule of God. But in Genesis chapter number 3, we see that upset we see the divided people of God. And then Scripture is going to uh, map out how man has struggled with that ever since. But there's always hope at the end of Scripture because we see how to get back. 
Genesis 3, uh, 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Let me put a little doubt in your mind, is what the devil does. It's what the devil did, it's what he continues to do. Let me put a little bit of doubt in the structure of this. God was reigning, God was ruling, but let me make you doubt that. Satan, the thing about Satan is that he is, uh, he has power, but he does not have all power. And he's not all that, he's not very creative. He uses the same tactics. Same thing that worked back in the garden is the same thing that he believes will work now. And it actually, it still does work. He knows that, but he keeps using it. He keeps using the tactics. Peter tells us to be, be vigilant, uh, to be always watchful uh, for our adversary, the devil, that he roams around like this lion seeking whom he may devour. He's always watching. A lion is not very creative. The lion just uses his brute force. He looks at it, and he, he looks at his prey, and he goes. And that's what the devil does. But the warning for us is to be watchful, to understand his tactics, to understand what he's trying to do. He's trying to make us doubt the efficacy of God ruling our lives as king through Jesus. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened. The tactic here is to have man rule instead of God. God's rule was that he would continue to reign, and he would continue to provide. The serpent made Eve, and ultimately Adam. He preyed upon their pride. He preyed upon their lust. God wanted them to rule the earth for him. The serpent allowed them to have or preyed upon their desire to rule the earth instead of God. And what we have now is an upside-down kingdom. Man ruling instead of God ruling. And it's our biggest plight. Whether or not we're going to rule or whether or not we're going to let God rule. And so bit by bit and week by week, We'll bring it back to where God would have us to be. But I at least wanted to give you kind of an understanding of what this kingdom of God was and the great problem of the kingdom, but the essentiality of the kingdom for the people of Jesus Christ. Pray with me, please. Lord, we say thank you for speaking to us through your word today. We pray that this word of the kingdom stays within our heart, that you would amplify it. Uh, that you would allow it to be essential to us, not only this week, but through our lives. Be with us now. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless.